if I was a young computer scientist coming out of college now, my 20s is the best time to get into the tech world. So for those of us who are a little older, uh, I, I reflect on what are the forces coming together. So I went up to Microsoft, I know Satya Nadella very well, I sat down with them and said, is there an ability of open AI? Because Microsoft was at the frontier of driving AI. In fact, in many senses, they still are at the frontier of doing that. Can you use open AI to basically search and navigate all our data on our platform. He says, yeah, there's this technique called retrieval augmented generation. You should look at basically applying RAG to secondary data. That's where the seed was born. Great, hello and welcome everyone to the next episode of AM Media House Podcast, Simulated Reality. Today we have the CEO of Cohesity with us, Sanjay Poonam. Welcome Sanjay, how are you doing? Today? Thank you, great to be with you. Fantastic. Thank you so much for making the time. I'm very sure. grateful. You know, we reached out uh, to you and we wanted to talk about different topics, especially I read about the Veritas acquisition and there were a lot of things going on about Cohesity, very strong organization with strong foundation, uh, doing a lot of things. But, you know, we, you know, we all wanted to talk about Gaia, uh, especially. Before we dive into the details, I just want to know from you what is what, what makes Gaia special for you know uh, for a, for a topic of discussion and you know your thoughts on the entire space of RAG. Well, listen, I think generative AI is a once in a lifetime kind of opportunity, um, and I think you know I've been kind of an analytics, I would say predictive analytics when I was in uh, as an undergrad in computer science. I came to this country as an immigrant on a scholarship to go to college. And when I studied computer science, we wouldn't call it AI, we'd call it predictive analytics, expert systems, it was all rule-based. But I think the entire advent of GPUs, you know, kind of inference, training models, embeddings, all of this stuff has been an enormous breakthrough. And I think if I was a young computer scientist coming out of college now, my 20s is the best time to get into the tech world. So for those of us who are a little older, uh, I, th I reflect on what are the forces coming together. You know, there's clearly a, a big move to the cloud. There's a big move into generative AI and security, and we play at the center of all of that. And I think generative AI for us is one of those sort of tip of the eye, tip of the spear moments for us to optimize what we could do to allow people the power of generative AI to search data. We store a lot of secondary data in backup archives. And that's usually looks like a tape. Okay, in the old days it was a tape. Yeah. What but is it looks like? Secondary data. So primary data is what's told in what's called hot systems. You know where you you can actively get to the data. That's why it's called primary. Uh, it might be filers, file and object systems. It might be databases. It might be live email. At some point in time, that that data starts to age and it becomes colder, and that's what the world calls secondary data. That's backup archives vaults, things of those kinds. So typically one example of secondary data is backup data. Yeah. So we've per been, you know, the, the company that's looked to secure and protect the world's data and provide insights into it. Yeah. And all of a sudden now that estate got significantly bigger uh, with the promise of what we can bring together, of course, with Veritas. But prior to all of that, generative AI allows us to crack open all that data that we manage on our platform and provide ways by which people can search and analyze and get summaries of that data. That's the most important breakthrough of generative AI. Yeah, correct, because Cohesity's offering was about data protection, security, governance, and those, you know, and kind of bringing the idea to tap into that secondary data and, you know, bringing first hand insight, insights to enterprises is a genius idea, firstly. The other thing that I read about Gaia when I was doing my research is that it has more general purpose capabilities. I want to understand what your, your perspective on what general purpose capabilities are and what does that mean uh, compared to some of the other offerings that other companies have. Yeah, I mean, right, first off, I mean, we patented, uh, we have a patent pending on this because no one has taken this approach, retrieval augmented generation, RAG, to secondary data. So uh, in everybody's been focused on protecting and securing that data. There's data security, there's data protection inventions, scanning algorithms, everything that protects you from the bad guys. But the ability to get insights into a lot of that data that's sitting there on your platform and to be able to ask questions, to have a conversation. For example, let's just say you're a bank and you have a lot of loan or risk data that's old files and you want to search and summarize that. It's all in your backup. You should be able to write a query into guy that says, please summarize all my documents from the past. Or maybe I sent you an email 10 years ago and I want to get a summary of what I did. So any unstructured data or structured data query on your old data 
it's typically sitting on our platform if the world's data is on our platform. If we secure the world's data, which has been our mission, yeah. then writing a query on that data in the past was impossible to get an answer to because you had to do what's called rehydration. You took the data out of your system in that set up platform and rehydrated it to then allow it to be able to, uh, okay. So if you think of data like an iceberg, okay, the top of the iceberg is primary data. As it ages, it becomes secondary, it goes to the bottom of the iceberg. Getting inside of that bottom of the iceberg is as tough as looking at the bottom of the iceberg. It's opaque, it's yeah. dark. Now, and if you wanted to get inside before, you had to take the data out of the bottom of the iceberg, bring it up to the top of the iceberg, and then you could get insights. We change that fundamentally. That's what Gaia does. It technologically, uh, so there are two aspects to it. One is the technology behind it. The other is also in terms of how organizations are structured and this. Holistically, if you have to approach, you have to address both of these to ensure that you know you turn data into knowledge. What were some of the difficulties that you faced initially, and you know what is it uh, how in building you, Gaia? In building Gaia, and also you know uh, overall. I mean, listen. The story I've talked about this publicly in a few other shows. None of us knew that this guy was an option until the, the approach that we took, till ChatGPT and OpenAI came out last year. So about last year, this time, February or March. I was playing around with ChatGPT, amazed that it could summarize some of the speeches I gave 15 years ago on analytics. I ran, I was president of SAP and ran the analytics business there. And then later on, I was, you know, CEO of VMware and I was very involved in the end user computing and mobility business. So I gave a lot of speeches. And much of that is in text and word form on the web. I wanted to see if OpenAI and ChatGPT could summarize my own speeches. did a pretty good job. So I came through with the learning that fundamentally this technology was one of the best summarization tool of lots of data. Well, if the world's data is on our platform, could we summarize it became my question. So I went up to Microsoft, I know Satya Nadella very well, I sat down with them and said, is there an ability of open AI? Because Microsoft was at the frontier of driving AI. In fact, in many senses, they still are at the frontier of doing that. Can you use open AI to basically search and navigate all our data on our platform? He says, yeah. There's this technique called retrieval augmented generation you should look at basically applying RAG to secondary data. That's where the seed was born. We went back, but we kept it under stealth because we wanted to be the first to do it and basically do it. So we patented that immediately because we know that we may have a two, three, four year head start of everybody else, but everyone else ultimately could do the same thing. And then we got to work implementing it. And it was for us kind of like, you know, our founding team were back like kids in a candy store. Yeah. They downloaded every computer science paper on RAG, they started reading about it and coding furiously. And here we are. A brainstorming session with Satya Nadella, is it? <laughs> I mean, it was just for me an idea generation and then yeah. we all got to work. Okay. Uh, interestingly, there was a person inside the company who was looking to leave the company to start a company that could do this generative AI on top of Croatia. They said, no, you're he's staying here. Greg Statman's <laughs> name. He ended up being a very key founding contributor to this effort. So really, I mean, this was almost, I call this the most fundamental innovation that Cohesity has worked on since we were founded 10 years ago. I have, I mean, I've not been here. Moet obviously founded this with incredible tech and I'm deeply grateful to him. I have not seen an innovative idea like this yeah. since we founded the company. So I think that that gave like a sort of almost like a rebirth moment yeah. for the company at about the 10 year anniversary to do something absolutely phenomenal. Then we started working closely with not just Microsoft, but Microsoft and NVIDIA. And you're gonna hear us doing more with NVIDIA. I mean, that's super exciting. Uh, then we started working with Google. Uh, so I think in the ecosystem, Microsoft and NVIDIA and Google and Amazon are gonna become very key partners. And we are now, I think, three or four years ahead of every one of our competitors in using generative AI to discover insights on business data. Everybody's using AI for security purposes. We are, others are, that's like table stakes. Okay, that you have to do. And we've been doing that for years and I'm gonna keep doing this. But for this use case, retrieval augmented integration, I think we are several years ahead of everybody else and we wanna stay innovative that way. One of the things uh, that has become big and you know, a lot of uh, funding is going in the Silicon Valley to companies is building AI co-pilots. Uh, AI co-pilots are a big thing, uh, which is the idea behind it is very similar, right? Basically being for democratized availability of data and insights to everyone within the organizations. How does uh, Gaia separate out from an AI co-pilot? Why does it go a step ahead? Yeah, I think, listen, first off, you have to ask yourself, 
the power of co-pilot is not the ability to build it. Anybody could build a co-pilot. Yeah. You have to have the data. Why is co-pilot so powerful in Microsoft's hands? Because a lot of the data is email, okay? Or they have a billion users of Office that they can now easily add that to. So they have either the tool or the data. Think of us like a Oracle or a Snowflake or Microsoft Office because all of that secondary data is on our platform. We set the mission to secure and provide insights in the world data, mm -hmm. okay? We had a couple of single digit exabytes of data on our platform. With Veritas, we will have hundreds of exabytes on our platform. So that data sitting on our platform, jointly cohesively, Veritas, imagine now co-pilots, that guy is a co-pilot for our data, okay? Being able to use that tool to ask questions on the data that's in our format, huge, no one else can do it. But then we can also apply that to, to filers that are sitting in primary data, Isilon, NetApp, there's no reason why we could not apply generative AI also there. And that's on our roadmap to get done. That opens up a huge avenue of Gaia being a co-pilot type product, okay, to have conversational AI on data sitting on Cohesity or non-Cohesity stores. Got it. So the, the huge, huge amounts of data that you have becomes your strength as well. But that also brings in the element of responsibility, right? Especially with, well said, uh, yeah. uh, especially with you know, uh, OpenAI since its launch has, has gone through a, you know, a, a rounds and rounds of uh, lawsuits and so many other things. But not just from the perspective of that, also, you know, being an ethical, uh, being in a, building ethical technology is also, I'm sure, cohesity is one of the primary uh, objectives. How do you take care of such humongous amounts of data responsibility and what is the uh, strategic approach to it? Yeah, you said it right. I think we have to, it, generally it's like you know, that proverbial debate about fire, a matchstick, right? Mm. I mean, is fire what keeps you warm? Or is it like kryptonite that like, you know, is, that arsonists can basically use to light a fire and basically, you know, burn down a house? Uh, it's both. And we have to use generative AI very responsibly. So we were one of the first at the time we started to announce it last year, April, May. Well before we shipped it, we started to talk about this concept of responsible AI. So what that means is if I have role-based access controls to allow me to ask a question on the data, then I should be also allowed to ask a question about historical versions of that data. So for example, if I'm allowed to ask a question about what the risk was in a set of documents that I have access to, and I also have access to the historical versions of that. When I ask that query through Gaia, it should let me do that. But if I'm not allowed to ask that question on current or historical versions of that document, I shouldn't be allowed to. And that's how Gaia will operate. It'll op operate within the role-based access controls, within the guardrails of what uh, fine-grained privileges are for access to documents or whatever have you, right? I mean, for example, email. Even though I'm CEO of the company, I'm not allowed to read other people's email. Uh, during a compliance check, our legal department might be allowed to check particular emails for people who may have violated that. That's even done by them. So even in the use case of Gaia to read or, or summarize emails, it's all going to be done within this sort of responsible AI framework. Got it. The other focus has always been when, when uh, the conversation around the dialogue around generative AI is the role of human intelligence. Leaders are convinced that Generative AI is going to augment human intelligence, right? Uh, what is your thought process with regards to uh, when Gaia is implemented in enterprises and enables decision making, not just for leaders, but you know, makes uh, data and insights available? What do you think is the role of uh, Gaia in enabling that intelligence rather than replacing the intelligence? I think it's again, uh, I think through metaphors, right? Would you drive a car today without GPS? Does that insult your human intelligence? No. <laughs> it's an assistance that helps you get there faster. So Gaia has to be viewed as a GPS. It's a summarization tool of your data. Yeah. Okay. Oh, you pick another example. Would you write a document today without spell check? Does that insult your human intelligence that you don't have to spell check? No. I mean, you hope your spelling is right, but you have something helping you. So that's how I tend to view it. Gaia is a summarization tool of all your historical data with links to the actual documents it got it from. Do I want a summarization tool? that can read vast amounts of thousands of pages and give me a synopsis, I might still then use my human intelligence on top of that summarization okay. to get more. So all of these to me are just helpers. If we want to make our value add that we're gonna read a thousand pages of documents and summarize it, you know, humans can do better. Okay. And it's the same way, like, you know, do I want to have a human being 
that is going around and manually checking all the streets uh, as a replacement of Google GPS? Heck no. I want the best mapping tool so I can listen to music in my car or whatever have you, right? I shouldn't have to be worried about pulling off on the side, looking up an atlas the old, the old days. So that's, I mean, to me, these debates are often about AI. If we start to look at it the way in which fundamental innovations like the printing press, the automobile, I mean, we're not going around in horse carriages anymore, we're going out in a car, is jet flying. I mean, all of these things are debates that every time there's a new innovation, society should debate. But we should come back to the fact that these are not replacing human beings, it's actually making us a lot more productive. Correct. The other aspect also is in terms of adoption and scalability and organizations who are producing tools uh, which are uh, generative AI tools or, you know, uh, you know essentially enabling uh, some of the enterprises and leaders to make decisions, they are talking a lot about adoption and scalability because that is a big roadblock. Uh, now this adoption is has to consider various aspects to it. One is the organizational uh, aspect to it. The other could be data security, uh, privacy, and overall governance of it. It could be the talent aspect of it. What is your approach when you consult with the clients, right? Along with offering Gaia, how do you uh, strategically support them so that they can adopt this to scale and then truly you know, imbibe it into their day-to-day Culture as yeah, I think the approach we're taking is by workload. We're starting off with M365, which is emails and OneDrive, which are documents in the cloud. And then we're going to go to other documents, various different document types. Uh, and then really going by industry and the use cases. We go to a bank and ask them, here's the question I ask any client. What is the question you want to ask on your historical data? That if you now had access to all of your historical data, documents, uh, you would want to put into the stool. Okay, show me my loans from, summarize my loan data or my risk data, that might be a bank. Show me some geoscience data, oil and gas. Show me my medical records, uh, healthcare. What we want to do is learn what those questions are, take a sample of the customer's data, prototype what Gaia could look like, show them. It's a little bit like an analytical BI tool, right? If you remember business intelligence tools, they would take people's data and then pr pr produce pretty dashboards to say, show you what it looked like. In some senses, Gaia is exactly that. It stands actually, Gaia stands for Generative AI App, okay? So it takes your data and it summarizes it, and, and they're like, wait, is there any restrictions on what data it could operate on? No, it's just operating on unstructured data. So we're gonna go um, cover the entire universe of unstructured data, emails, files, whatever have you, and then we're gonna get to the universe of structured data, right? And that's a little bit different because it's databases and queries and stuff like that. Correct. Finally, uh, it is very crucial for organizations to look at uh, generative AI from a very uh, from a longevity perspective, right? People are talking that it's very crucial for uh, companies or service providers who work with us to have a long-term vision. They should at least have you know five, ten years of what they are doing. Uh, I'm sure there is a set of functionalities, there is a set of POCs, and some projects even in production that you are thinking. What lies ahead for Gaia in terms of improving its overall functionality, and where do you? What is your what What is your vision for Gaia in the next five years, ten years? Well, I think at least for the next year, we want to advance all the workloads and by vertical industry. This becomes very quickly a vertical industry pitch. You know, what are we doing in oil and gas? What are we doing in retail? What are we doing in banks? What are we doing in hospitals? We're in public sector, and I live that type of thinking at SAP because I ran the industry groups there. Uh, so very quickly, I think you start to have a very relevant conversation for a particular industry uh, with that customer. And then you can go to every company in that same industry with the same proposition. Once you've solved what Gaia could do one oil and gas company, you can do it for everyone in that sector. It's not proprietary then because the questions they're asking on their data are the same questions another oil and gas peer of them is doing. So we will learn a lot of what those use cases are and apply it by vertical industry to everyone in a particular industry. Banking, uh, financial services, healthcare, retail, uh, oil and gas, manufacturing. And some are gonna be horizontal scenarios across all industries. Compliance is a good example. Email compliance or discovery, e-discovery is a fairly horizontal across all industries. Yeah. But there are gonna be some very vertical uh, specific uh, uh, data sets. Uh, so this really for me tugs at a little bit of my heart I fundamentally believe the opportunity for this industry, data protection, is a security play and a insights AI play. 
right? And today, most of the companies have been saying, well, we use AI for security, right? We are a Snowflake meets Palo Alto type opportunity in one, okay? That's both a data play around analyzing data and a security play. And that's a tremendous opportunity for us to go and prosecute and do very well. Fantastic to hear, uh, you know, first time thoughts from you, Sanjay. Thank you so much for making the time uh, for this interview. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Cheers.